my name is Sarah. I'm on staff here, and I am so thankful that you've decided to join us today. If you are hosting a watch party right now, I just want to let you know at any point during the service, feel free to pause, have some discussion together. You might see some questions on the screen. Use that as an opportunity for conversation and growth with whoever you are watching with right now. If you're watching by yourself, you don't really know what a watch party is, we're asking everyone to find a group of people, maybe a family of two or more, groups of two or more, gathering together in homes of places you're already gathering and feel comfortable to be in to have engagement and helping each other trust and follow Jesus through this content that we are providing for you. If you want to host a watch party, maybe you're already gathering some people together, we'd invite you to check that out as well. We need, would love more people to have the opportunity to join us um, in this content. So you can go to onelifechurch.org, scroll down, find the watch party graphic there. You can find information about hosting or also just find a watch party to join if you're looking for one to be a part of right now. We are in a series called Because 2020. I'm so excited about it. We worship Jesus because. I'd love to hear some of the reasons why you worship Jesus. We talked about extravagant worship last week. We're going to continue talking about some of the things here in the last 10 years that we've been excited to be worshiping Jesus through here at One Life Church. Uh, but I'd love to hear some of the reasons for you. Uh, take a picture wherever you're watching today, wherever you're engaging with people today. Use the hashtag One Life Anywhere and also in the comments or in your posts, let me know one of those reasons why you worship Jesus. Guys, all of those links and descriptions are in the description below wherever you're watching right now. I'm so excited to be joining with you. Let's go. Well, I don't mind saying that that night that we just showed was one of the greatest nights of my life. It really was. And during this series, we're celebrating. You'll see things like that because that was 10 years ago. We're celebrating our 10th anniversary. And, but it's a great question to ask. Have you ever let out a shout for, for joy over anything? And maybe you haven't, maybe you have. And, and I know that when I ask that, when you ask it in a religious context or a church context, some people think, no, I haven't, because that's the stuff of fanatical freak show kind of thing. I wouldn't do that, you know. But not only just in a religious context, you need to think about that, but just in any context. I think it happens the most, and you've probably done this if you're being honest, uh, at sporting events. I think that's, that's just kind of how it goes. But, and, and here's why. It often happens because sports are, are like these miniature stories. They're these miniature dramas that you don't know exactly where they're going to go and how they're going to go. And what can happen in sports is it can look like everything's going wrong. You're going to lose, and the clock is running out, but things can change just like that. Just you can go from losing to winning. If, the, if that last second shot goes in or if that Hail Mary pass is caught, it can go from complete dark to complete light. And when that happens, if you've ever been in that, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have in your living rooms, you know, when your team did something like that, you just let out a, ah, you know, one of those things. We just do that. And, uh, and if you don't think you do, I mean, we live in a culture that does this. Look at this picture. 
uh, and I apologize. Yeah, that's, that's how people really are. Oh, by apologize, uh, by the way, to my Henderson, uh, Kentucky people. That, that's Duke. I didn't realize that was Duke fans. I just picked a picture that was somebody was yelling, and uh, I don't know what Duke has to yell about anyway, uh, but uh, my apologies out to you guys. I want to be sensitive to your needs. Okay, so, um, but, but we have that. That's why we do that at sporting events, but it can be done in praise. Now, what we're talking about during this series is worship and praise and how is it, it is expressed, and I want you to keep your eye on that concept of going from darkness to light, of going from real difficulty to hope. And because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't mean to keep repeating it, but I know, and I keep hearing this in different conversations, that during this time of 2020, uh, people's anxieties are up, and they're struggling more than they typically do, and things can be uh, dark, things can be disillusioning at times for people, and discouraging. And so I want you to hear what we're about to say uh, in the context of how do you answer that. Now, the way we've been doing this and we're going to do throughout the series is we're going to look at one statement that Jesus made, and I'm going to argue that it's the most controversial statement that he made about himself. And we're going to examine it. Here is the statement. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, we all know why that's controversial. We, we want to live in, we live in a pluralistic society, and we want to be live and let live kind of people, and that's commendable, but, and that sounds exclusive because it is, and we struggle over it, and that's why we want to face into it. Now, I promise you that in the course of this series, we're going to deal directly with the exclusive claim. We're going to deal directly with the reason that we struggle with this and try to answer that question. But I don't want to do that just yet, because the first step that I want to do is I want to make sure that we understand the statement himself itself and really have a grip on why he said it and how it actually applies in the flow of his thought. And the key to the way to do that, the first law of Bible interpretation, I would argue, is context. You want to see things in their flow of thought. And this statement happened in a particular time and in a particular context. It's, it's found in John chapter 14, uh, but John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are a long discourse uh, that are deep and profound, and they happen this way. And because of this, here's the context. Chapter 13 opens this way, sets up the whole thing. It says, now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. And then it goes on from there. So in other words, the context of this is this is Jesus' last night of being alive. Now think about that even for your own life. What if you knew tonight is the last time you're living, you're dying tomorrow morning? How, who would you gather together with? What would you say is a very, very good question. And Jesus does things a certain way. And, and guys, this is the greatest life that's ever been lived in the history of life. And therefore, we ought to be on the edge of our seats. You know, this is that at the very, very end. And so he's, he's speaking to his closest followers. Now, notice what he does. He gathers up his closest followers, and it notes that he loved them to the end. Now, we keep saying this. One of our chief values around here is we do life in groups and teams. Church is not supposed to be just a solo act where you do just kind of watch a sermon occasionally. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. A church is supposed to be a group. It is a gathering of people, and that's modeled after Jesus. So on his last night, he's with his closest followers. But not only that, what's going to happen with his closest followers, they don't realize. And what he's doing, he's preparing them for something they've never seen before. He's preparing them where they're going to go from very bright light to complete darkness. Almost overnight. Now think about what they've been through. For three solid years, they've followed closely the single greatest life ever lived. They've seen amazing things. They've watched this guy be surrounded by thousands of people, people crushing in on him, him healing people. They've seen blind eyes see and deaf ears hear, and people have been paralyzed for life uh, rise up just a few days before this. They had seen him raise someone from the dead who had been dead for four days. Imagine what a rush that would have been. Imagine how electric it would have felt. 
And imagine their attitude of we are following the right guy. We're following the guy that's got the answers. We're following the guy that's going to take over. We're following the guy that's going to bring in all the promises. Their, their emotions are up here. It's like, yes, we're on the right team. And what Jesus knows is all of that is about to go away in their minds. One of them was about to, one of the closest followers of all, one of their friends that they had hung out with for three years is going to betray him. And he makes that very, very clear. He basically says to all of them, you're all going to fail. There's a test coming up and you're all going to fail it. And especially the main leader. Because Jesus keeps telling them, he keeps saying things like, I'm going somewhere and you can't come with me. And, and Peter, their main leader, he, he, he says, oh, well, maybe if everybody else, you know, they may not go with you, but I'll go with you. I'll give my life for you. And then at the end of chapter 13, here's what goes on. Peter says that, and Jesus turns to him and says, oh, actually, it's not going to go that way. Here's what's going to happen to you is by the time the sun comes up tomorrow, you're going to deny you even know me, and you're going to do it three different times. And then imagine if you, that's the leader, and everybody's looking around at each other like, what in the world's going on? Now, that denial prediction is what happens right before the primary context of the passage that we're looking at, the beginning of chapter 14. He's just told Peter that. Now listen to what he says. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And at that point, I love this because Thomas stops him and, and, and he says, uh, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Which is an excellent question. He's been talking about going, we don't even know where you're going. How in the world will we know the way to, way to get there? And here's our statement. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, that's the context of where it flows, okay? Now, think about this. He's warning them. He's preparing them. He's helping them understand that things are about to go from light to dark. They are about to enter into disillusionment. They're about to enter into discouragement. And he's coaching them through it in advance. So what's the first thing he says? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Easy for him to say, right? And, and actually, language experts will tell you that that's an imperative. Do not let. In other words, it almost sounds like, to the, like uh, your heart's about to get troubled. You're, you're going to have lots of reasons for your heart to get troubled. There are lots of reasons. They're, they're, he's going to die. They're going to watch him die. They're going to let down themselves. They're going to have one of their closest ones betray, or this, uh, betray him. There's all this kind of thing that's going to go on. And he says what? Do not let your hearts be troubled. And it is. It's imperative. It sounds more like, like you're going to let your heart be troubled? Stop it. Just stop it. Just don't do it. Which sounds kind of cold in a way. Just stop it, stop it, stop it. Now, it doesn't sound quite that cold if you read it fully. He doesn't just tell them to stop it outright. He follows immediately by giving them a series of reasons why they shouldn't. In other words, don't be discouraged. Don't let your heart be troubled, and he gives them a series of reasons why not. And the first one, he says, you believe in God, you believe also in me. In effect, he just says, okay, listen, you guys, you've believed in God ever since you were a little kid, and you've been following me around. You believe in me. You've believed in me. I've given you every reason to believe in me. Just keep doing it. And it's very tempting at this point to point out that Jesus essentially said, don't stop believing but I, I'm not going to do that because that would be kind of hokey to do. You know, because it's very tempting to don't stop believing. It's just, I, I, I'm not saying Jesus did that, but it, it, that's really kind of what he did. All right. That maybe that's where Journey got the idea. I don't know. It could happen. But you, in other words, you built up all this trust. Don't let it stop just because there's lots of reasons that you're observing that would make you do that. I love what one pastor said. Um, and maybe you've heard this before. He said, never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. Never doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. He's saying, guys, you've seen three years of this stuff. You, you believe in me now. And even though circumstances are about to go completely opposite, has that ever happened to you? As me. Things are going great. And all of a sudden they're not. Don't doubt in the dark what God has told you in the light. So he gives them, and then he gives them something very specific to believe in. 
Jesus is not just talking about belief itself or believe in yourself. He said, believe in, believe in God, you believe in me. Now, he goes on to do this whole thing, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. All right, so I want to spend some time on this one because um, it, it's been read at many, many, many fu- funerals, and that's highly appropriate. That's a good thing. But this statement, I think, can be caricatured in our minds. I think it can become a cartoon in our minds. And the reason for that is, is that um, many people have heard this statement out of what's called the King James Version of the Bible. It's the one that was published in 1611. It sounds kind of Shakespearean. It's, a very, it's considered a very good translation of the Bible. Nothing wrong with it. But it uses words occasionally that can throw us off a little bit. If you read that in the King James Version, it would say, in my father's house are many mansions. You ever heard that one before? Are many mansions. And w- as Americans, when we hear mansions, we're like, mansions? Whoa, yeah, a mansion is, you know, a 30,000 square foot uh, house with got like a 15 car garage and there's a Porsche and there's a Rolls Royce and there's a Ferrari and there's a hot tub in every single room. There's, there's, uh, that's a mansion. You know, there's gold driveway. Whatever your, whatever your notion of mansion is, that's what we read into it. And we see Jesus kind of up there. He's got his tool belt on and he's like, I want to give their ideal mansion. I'm going to build something that looks like it's in the Virgin Islands and I've got these blueprints and swinging hammers and all that kind of stuff. And when it comes to the right moment, I'm going to bring you to your mansion. Now, I hate to be a buzzkill. I really, really do. Well, that's not what he's talking about, all right? Now, you may get a mansion in heaven. That may be a thing. I don't know, but that's not what he's saying. Now, you need to know that there's like three different schools of thought among commentators and people who spend their lives studying the Bible, interpreting the Bible on this passage. What is he talking about? Well, one school of thought is kind of the traditional one, but not quite that cartoonish. It's saying that what he's talking about is he is going to prepare a place called heaven, and he, at his second coming, he's going to come back and bring us to that place, and whether you get a mansion or a shack or whatever else is, is kind of how that's going. Uh, but in other words, it's very, very future. Now, you may not know that there's a second school of thought, and one of the, my very favorite commentators in life, I love this guy, uh, he's in this school of thought, and it's that he's not talking about the second coming that we're anticipating. He's talking about what happens immediately after this, his resurrection, and then his preparing a place is preparing a place in the Father's presence and the, and the giving of the Holy Spirit at the day of Pentecost. That's what he's talking about. I'm going to come and receive you to myself. Well, that one's pretty good too. Now, there's this third school of thought. And that's where I am. And you don't have to be there. If you don't want, we're going to provide some resources online. And and if you want to look at these commentaries yourself, you can. Uh, But the third school of thought is honestly a mix of the two. And I think that's really what's going on here. Now, the reason I think that is because this word translated mansions or dwelling places is used only twice in the entire Bible, and they're both in this chapter. The other place, he used it just there. And the other place is down at verse 23. Listen what he says. Another one of his disciples asked him a question, by the way. And it says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him, as the translation I'm using says. Make our abode with him. That word translated abode is the same one that's translated mansions, dwelling places. Now, unfortunately, we don't use the word abode a lot either. Where is your abode? You ought to pull that on somebody someday, see what kind of look you get, you know. Um, where do you, where's your abode? I'm, ab- I'm abiding at a certain place. We don't use that a lot. But listen, it's, it's, it's communicating an idea that obviously it doesn't mean mansions because he's not saying my father and me are going to build a mansion in you. That doesn't make any sense, right? What are, they, what are they building? The NIV translates this home. My father and I will set up home with you. Dwelling place is a pretty accurate thing. Dwelling place, abode, when you put those ideas together, I think the NIV is right on that. It's home is what he's saying. And when you stop and you think about home, whether it's a mansion or whatever it is, that's not really what makes a home, is it? What are the things that make up a home? Think about that. I mean, and, and I have to admit, I, I, I had a great home growing up. I had the, uh, the ultimate old, all-American experience. I grew up in the Midwest. My mom always had snacks for us when we got home from school. I would go on my bike. I would go ride around, play baseball with my friends. I did that kind of stuff. I had a nice home when I was growing up. I had a home you could call home. Now, I know some of you didn't have that experience. When you were growing up, home was a place you avoided. 
But I want you to think about the ideal of what, what truly makes a home. Many of you are young parents, and you're trying to build a home. What are you trying to build? Is it you know, like a 30,000 square foot house? No. When you're trying to build a home, you're trying to build a place that has certain characteristics to it. What are the characteristics? Now, it almost, it, it almost sounds kind of uh, trivial to say this or a little, uh, a little hokey to say it, but because I've seen, I think, this statement embroidered in, and put it in a frame before, that home is where love lives. But it's kind of true, though, isn't it? What makes home is the love that's there. No matter what kind of house it's in, it doesn't really make any difference. Now think about how, how is home different from the different places that you have in your life? You, know, you, you go to school, or you go to the coffee shop, or you go to work. What's the difference between that and home? How do you, how do you act? Well, for one, you can go to the refrigerator without asking anybody's permission. Pretty cool. You can put your feet on the coffee table, at least with one person's per permission, you know? You, you, there's different things that you do. When you're at home, what do you do? You kind of do, <sighs> I believe with all my heart that that is what he's talking about. And let me give you what I want you to get if you don't get anything else when you walk out today. From this statement and from what Jesus is talking about that's controversial and we struggle with it for all kinds of reasons, but here's the essence of it. Never forget this. Why do we worship? And how should we respond whenever it's, it's dark in life or disillusioning in life or the lights have gone out? Always remember you have a home and you're going home. Always remember, you have a home, and you are going home. Um, in other words, theologians would say right now, we're living in what's called the already and not yet. We're living in the already, not let yet. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. You know what he's doing? I think he's naming off everything that he's about to do. The next morning, he's going to die on the cross for our sins so you can go home. Because entry to the home has to be, your sins have to be atoned for. We're all moral failings, and he's going to die on the cross, and he's going to rise again from the dead to defeat death and to assure that we really have this and do this. His, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his giving of the Spirit at the day of Pentecost has included that, but also the second coming and everything that we have. When you come to faith in Christ, if you are in Christ, you have a home, and you're going home because Jesus prepared the place. When you have placed your faith fully in who he is and you've asked him for forgiveness for your sins and you've applied his blood to who you are, he's prepared that place and he's given you a home. And he's also going to give you a home you're going for. You have a home and you are going home. And he's saying, listen, when the lights go out and you're discouraged and you're disillusioned, always remember that one thing. You have a home and you're going home and I've prepared it for you and you have the entry. He says, in my, father's in my father's house, there are many rooms. That word house can be translated as state. It's like the sum total of all of his property. And the father was viewed back in those days, when he said that, they would have, they would have viewed him as, 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 the, as the one who has the estate. In other words, if you want to walk on to the estate, you have to do the things that he's done to prepare it. Okay, so all during the summer, for those of you who have been tracking with us, I have been telling stories about how my son was in Army training. I'm going to try to do this just one more time as an analogy, all right, and then I'll leave it alone. I'll, I'll get, but he, he finally got home. But this was particularly appropriate to this subject. So for those of you who are veterans and you've done Army training before, um, you know that going on to an army base to do that is the exact complete opposite of home, all right? And they make sure it's that way. As soon as you get on that bus, you go through those gates, they close those gates behind you. They tell you things like, he said, they would give speeches like, you have no rights here. We are your rights. And you're going to do exactly what we say to do, exactly when we say to do it, and how to do it. They taught you how to eat. They, they, taught, they told you when you could brush your teeth. They controlled every last minutia thing in your life. Your clothes, everything is controlled. And it's the opposite of home. And he said, you know what he would do when he was laying awake at night on his bunk? Besides going, what have I done to myself? <laughs> Why did I do this? He said he thought of the details of home all the time. Always thought about home. He knew he had a home, and he knew he was going home. And what they coached us to do as the family before we put him on the bus before he left, he said, make sure you write letters. Make sure you write letters because you know what? He's going to have to hear that he has a home. 
And I want you to picture that in this life, when, the, when life goes dark and it's discouraging and disillusioning and hard and difficult, it's kind of like that. That you're getting letters from home. You have a home currently. If you are in Christ, you have a home. And reading the New Testament is like getting letters from home and you are going home. No matter how hard things get or how difficult they are or how dark they are, you have a home and you are going there. And home is where love is. And yes, we did get to have the experience. He came home, he had the big green black backpack on, on his back and he came in the door and we all hugged because we hadn't seen him since March. And he was welcomed home. As an added bonus, I did catch myself doing this. We've been remodeling our house like forever, and I hadn't done his room yet. While I was gone, I was like, I'm going to do his room. i got to do his room. So I set up his room and kept the things that he had in it. But as his dad, I kind of know things that are special to him or meaningful to him, and I put them all over his room. And it set it up real nice, and the new floor, new thing. And he walked into the room, and he, he was like, oh, wow, this home. And the reason Jesus uses that analogy is because many of us can connect with that. That's exactly what you have. If you are in Christ, you have a home and you're going home. And I keep saying in Christ. You know another word that the Bible uses for hell? Outside. Outside. The picture is not having a home. The picture is when all of the age is, 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 is consummated into what Christ has done, there will be those who are outside the home. Now, the beauty of it is no one has to stay that way. The beauty of it is, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And the next morning, he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again from the dead, and he did all the things that it takes to be a child in the home. You have a home. And you're going home. And if you don't have that now, it's as simple as that. Hey, I want to have a home. I'm outside now, and I don't want to stay that way. And you can just say, God, I repent. I, I, I turn around from building my own home, which is never going to last. And I want to go for your home. And you ask him to come in your life, and that's exactly how it works. And at that point, at that moment, you have a home. And you're going home. And when it's fulfilled... You're going to be just like my son. You're going to show up with your green backpack. And you're going to be able to throw it down. And you're going to be welcomed because you're home. There's a great song that our team is going to come up. And they're going to lead us in worship. And we're going to respond in worship here in a moment across all of our campuses and, and home online. But it's called The Blessing. And it's taken from the Old Testament. And what it is, is it. It, the, the priests used to stand over the congregation and they used to give this blessing and they would say these words and I think it matches home because it communicates this idea of what a home is supposed to be. It'll say the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. And then it talks about generations and your children. This is what we want for you. And that's what God wants. He wants, he says, I go to prepare a place for you that you can have a home and you are going home. And you can receive that. And then it closes with this line. And I love this line. And we're going to sing this in a moment. And I want you to hear this. It just repeats over and over again. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. And I want you to translate that I have a home. I have one right now. And I am going home because I'm in Christ. And here's what's going to happen. As, we, as they kind of lead us into the song, there's going to be a, a question up here on the screen. And wherever you are, just think about this for a moment. Just kind of mull it over. And then here in just a couple minutes, the team will begin to lead us into the journey of this song about blessing and home. So wherever you are, if you're at home, um, we are just inviting you just to worship with us. If you're at a watch party, if you're at one of our campuses, um, I would ask that you just stand with us. Uh, we're going to spend some time worshiping together um, as one church in multiple locations. So spend some time worshiping with us this morning. The Lord bless you 
and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing amen with us.
Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Lindy, and we're going to go into one more song here. But before we do that, um, I was thinking about a discussion question, actually, from last week that Pastor Brett challenged us on. He said, what is something that inspires you to worship? And for me, a lot of times it's when I read the scripture, and all of a sudden it's like, it makes sense. There's an aha moment for me. That a lot of times just inspires me to worship God more um, closely than I did maybe before. And so just a couple weeks ago, I was reading this passage of scripture from Exodus 17. And so Joshua is being sent to fight. uh, And Moses is being told to go into another location. So here it says, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. So what hit me about this, and I've heard this story before, um, and I've actually talked about it before, but what hit me is that Moses is just simply worshiping. Moses, when he's raising his hands, he is in the presence of God. And so I've always just felt like there was this physical act that somehow when he did it, um, they were winning. But in fact, he was just spending time worshiping God. And that physical response is what caused them to win the battle. God was the one at work, not them. And so I think sometimes we're in this battle and we feel like we're the ones winning the war when our response should be worship. Our response should be raising our hands to our God because he's the one who intervenes. He's the one who's at work. And what I love too is that you see such a picture of Moses who starts to struggle and the physical response becomes a little too much for him. So Aaron and her have to come alongside. But you stand, first of all, Moses is standing on a rock. And you see this, that he's standing on Jesus. His firm foundation is on Jesus. And as he stands there and his friends come alongside him, he's able to continue to hold his hands up. So maybe you're at home um, and you desire some people that maybe come alongside you. I would encourage you to get in a watch party. I would encourage you to come to one of our campuses because I think we've all recognized that community um, is is what is so important for the church to come alongside. There's times when our hands start to waver. There's times that it's hard and we're struggling But when we stand with our hands in the air, we're admitting, one, that we need a Savior, and we're admitting that other people need to help us. So if that's you today, I just challenge you to get in a place of community because we're going to spend some time worshiping because truly that is our greatest weapon. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Come on, let's put our hands in the air. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a
our voices and sing a little louder, all right? Here we go. Oh, sing a little louder. Let me hear you. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. It's the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Oh, sing a little louder. Every time it's right for me. Sing a little louder. It's the presence of my enemy. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Every comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. You got it. that communicated hope to you. I really do. And uh, because what was, we want to demystify worship during this series, always remember that worship is responding to worth. And you can do that through singing and through raising your hands and through instrumentals. You can do that through serving. Many people do that. And we also do that by giving. And when we give, uh, it's a response to who God is, but it's also a response to who we are. It's what we do during the middle of the week, our, our toil, our strain, our problem solving, our issues that we have at work. We collect that up and read that. So you can give if you would like to. We don't want you to feel any pressure at all. Uh, but you can give online. You can give on our app. Uh, if you're at one of our campuses, you can give out in the lobby, and you'll see someone there. But I hope more than anything, everybody will remember that you have a home, and you are going home. We'll see you next time.